Hi. Um, my name is Sebastian um, Sivio. I'm talking here about the soft IQ problem we have in RT. Um, it's not mostly a um, correctness problem, it's um, optimization and from the workload point of view, um, which goes down the hill. Um, before we start, um, let me bring you up to speed how soft IQ works on RT compared to what you have in non-RT kernels. Um, basically, the whole thing is parameterable. Um, we don't do hard IRQ. If you look at networking, for instance, um, we have the, this thread that runs the networking thread, uh, the networking uh, interrupt. And since it's a thread, it's parameterable. And parameterable means context switch is possible. So we could schedule out to user land. We can schedule out to a different interrupt thread. And in vanilla, you have this piggyback. So once the hard IRQ is done, and someone raised the soft interrupt, then you switch to the soft interrupt at the end of the hard IRQ. So you uh, continue going on um, with interrupts enabled, but you do only soft interrupts. And we don't have this on RT. We don't raise uh, hard interrupts from, uh, we don't raise soft interrupts from hard IRQ. Whenever this happens, it's usually exceptional. And this goes to case of IRQD. And this is a different problem. And since we are preemptible, this local BMG disable uh, is required to act as a, as a per CPU lock because we need to synchronize this interrupt versus the other because all those things that may happen. Um, as a result of this, the, the lock that we have in local bottom up disable acts properly and all the resources are protected. Um, the downside is that long running threads um, block other interrupt threads that could be more important. They may have a higher priority assigned, and this is not considered. Also, you have tasklets, timers, and whatever soft IQ wise that is um, running thread up for some reasons. This also blocks uh, thread interrupts. And if you run soft interrupts on uh, vanilla, what you have is that you do like 10, uh, one round, and then you look, am I, do I have this need to reset bit set? And if you do this, then you just stop and continue case of IQD for, for the iterations. But we don't do this in RT. The problem is that we uh, have always um, RT priorities. And instead of setting the need to reset, what you do is a PI boost. So we inherit a priority. And the intention is originally to uh, promote the thread to a higher priority to get this thing done quicker and release the lock. But in terms of soft IRQ, um, this continues to run and run and continue to run as long as it can to, con to complete all those things, and then it's done. And this is suboptimal. Um, this is an output from um, SketchSwiss uh, Tracer. I remove all um, the non-important parts, but the important thing is that you have um, the networking thread that basically raises the soft IRQ. And this wakes and continues to, to run. And then you have another interrupt, in this case, um, HACI for block IR. And you see you have the wake of the thread, and then you have a sketch switch. And within that thread, nothing happens except you give the priority to the networking thread, so you raise uh, the priority. Lower number means higher priority, and then you switch back to networking again. And this continues to run until networking is done, and then you switch over once you release the lock. And then this is the earliest time that, net, that HSCI, as in block, continues to do whatever it wants. So ideally, we would not continue doing networking, but hand over to block and do what it wants, and then continue networking where we left off. For the um, locking reasons we have, we cannot do that. Um, so this is like an artificial case I made, for, uh, and we have other problems. For instance, you could have an FPGA driver, which you don't con uh, control from the kernel, but you only do in user land, and you only need the interrupt to wake up. And this interrupt would be like high prior, but it will be blocked uh, for the uh, bottom half reasons. And it's always hard to explain to people why do we need this. Also, um, if you would have a CAN driver, and you also need to inject like one packet into the stack that is forwarded over to user land, it's always hard to explain why do we need to wait until the whole networking stops, 
doing whatever it does, and then we can inject the, the packet. <coughs> and so the bottom half this able enable thing is basically to preserve the soft IQ race and uh, execute semantics. And from what I know, it's mostly per CPU resources that need protection that way. And so I've been working on a proof concept to get rid of this global lock and make it uh, smaller, like only the regions that need protection, that they get protected properly. And what I came up is um, a function called lock lock nested ph. This is from after something we have already in the kernel called preempt disable nested. Um, in MM and C groups wise code, we have sometimes a spin lock that is held, and the spin lock by itself disables preemption, but on RT it doesn't. And there's code further down the road that relies on this preempt disable section, uh, which is missing on RT. So that's where we have this preempt disable nested, just to ensure preemption is disabled only on RT, while non RT can just verifies that preemption was disabled earlier on. And so, as I said, this thing uh, disables then only, it does the lock only on RT, while mainline is verified versus is bottom half really disabled. And the race of IOQ and everything we had before is continuing to work as, um, as we had it. And not to add the locks like everywhere we need, like lock and unlock, we came up with a guard notation that Peter Tilsway introduced like two or one or two kernels releases ago. Um, so this is what it would look like. This is from Napik uh, Allocache. This is a passive use drug used in networking for um, SKB allocating. So basically they have um, a page struct that is allocated once and every allocation just borrows part of the page. And if it's empty, it's empty and it gets reloaded. But the point is um, this operation is racy if it's interrupted in the wrong place. Um, so instead of doing lock unlock, there's only a guard statement here as you see it. And that guard statement does this um, lock lock nested BH, which is basically the lock lock only for um, RT for this particular resource and invokes uh, page frag R log with that log held. And once the return completes, the compiler automatically inserts the unlock on its own. So there's nothing more to it. Um, the other thing where you clearly see that the local BH disabled protected resource is um, native alloc SKB, mostly the same thing. And here we use these scope guards thingy where you introduce a context where you have um, the lock unlock part for RT only, and it's limited to, to this part. So it basically moves the code to the side with the scope guard. Um, one thing I identified also was this um, recursion thing we have. Um, basically checks that if you recurse in, within the networking stack, you have an upper limit of five or six iterations before it assumes you loop indefinitely. On RT, the problem is if you get preempted, you can have five tasks, each of them um, increments the counter independently, resulting that it um, triggers the indefinitely lookup deadlock thingy. Um, so for RT, we need to override it to have an owner, which has it, and a lock for the protection. So basically this extends it a little bit, and then there is um, this part which basically <coughs> checks if I'm the owner or if it's someone else, if it's someone else we block on the counter. This is not ideal since we would um, PI boost other tasks uh, using it, but I don't think it matters much for, from correctness point of view. Ideally it would be per task, but I think this is way simpler. And it didn't uh, bother us in the past. Um, next thing is BPF. Um, the normal BPF part is, as far as I've been explained by few people, is already have um, their own logs for data structures and everything. So we should be fine if we do a BPF program and get interrupted. There are also recursion checks for perf, trace, and so on. So this will continue to work as they do already. Um, XDP is the only part that is missing things. Um, if you do XCP redirect, there are per CPU variables which um, have the state, how do you do the redirect? 
and then it may add things to the PCPU uh, lists for the flush later on. So this needs to be protected if we get uh, preempted uh, midway. So this is like one thing um, for the flush, and then we need to uh, tackle all the drivers. And fashion-wise, there are a few differences, like this one would ideally get, um, so this is like the simple way, just guard at the beginning before you call into BPF, and once you return from the function, you have the unlock, and this is it. There are other drivers which only do um, XTP, uh, the BPF run, but they don't do redirect. So then you can go for the, uh, for the scope guard and only protect the invocation since you don't do redirect later on in the case switch later later within the code. Um, ideally, to have um, everything together, you could um, move the XCP redirect return code up to the function it's called. Because the remaining part of the switch case is, switch case is we don't care, we, do, we don't understand, we had an error and whatnot. So this is not required for protection. This would look different, but move the code around. Theoretically, we could have the guard at the top and keep everything as it is, unless there are like two drivers, I think, which do the flush within the switch statement. And with this, with this change, this is what the same test case looks in the tracing. You see the networking driver starts doing its thing. The HCI driver comes up and wants to do something as well. It gets preempted. It does not wait for networking to finish. It does its thing right away. And once uh, the block is done, it switches back to the networking driver, continue doing its thing. Like this is not limited to networking. I always basically all force interrupts and soft IQ context work in general. Um, right, so this is where the per CPU resources I've been looking at. This covers like 90% of what I've seen. Um, there is this networking uh, timer, which is special. And I've been looking at the history, it's been moved forth and back, and this is what we ended up as of today. The timer itself is uh, made pins, so it's only fires on the one CPU we are on. And the color of this function is mostly this. We allocate the timer at the front, then we disable bottom half, so the timer cannot fire, because uh, the bottom halves are disabled, so timer is deferred as well. And then we set up the structures, do the hash dense, which insert in some kind of data structure. I mean, the comment says we're not allowed to touch it afterwards, but we still do it. I hope it's okay, but this is it. And I didn't add any locks here, but we would need some protection versus the timer. And I've been looking at it the last few weeks, and I think we could rework the whole thing, not to rely on the pin thing, and just set everything up, insert it, and then be good with it, because most of the drivers are doing it. The pin timer are a minority in the kernel. There are only a few instances, and this is one of them. And right, the page pool we have, I've been talking to Elias while I've sent fix-ups uh, earlier on, um, and the way it's been explained to me is that the page pool is safe, because we only um, allocate memory in soft IRQ and put it back without any locking back to the pool in the fast pass uh, within the same soft IO context. There's no access within work queue or process context across CPU and anything else. So from that point of view, it should work basically. We had a few drivers got fixed in the meantime. So from our, from our T point of view, it should be safe to accept it as is. And this is it. Do we like this guard thingy? for per CPU protection. The question is whether um, we are sure that we can identify all the the bits and pieces which need re-entrancy protection if we drop the, the, the whole uh, global or CPU global bottom half uh, serialization. I mean, that's the thing which we need to worry about. And I mean, the, if this works out, then the, the 
the next obvious question is, do we need the whole bottom half crap even outside of RT? I mean, uh, we were debating this on and off, and we all know how good the heuristics work, uh, which are involved here, they don't. Um, so, uh, but this might be a way forward, I don't know. Uh, it, it does change a little bit how we design this, whether we just want to have a, the, 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 we, whether, because I think for RT we will make some sacrifices on performance, right? And it will be easier to accept the, the fixes that only are needed for RT versus if we look at it as like we're going to deprecate entire software queue. I don't think it to make it mandatory for, 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 for non-RT. But if we can push it in for RT and figure, play with it and figure it out, it might be a way to with the more generic solution, which we, I mean, we all know how badly networking today suffers from the whole soft IRQ concept already. Because we have these, okay, we, we, we do soft IRQ processing for some time and then the block comes in and does soft IRQ processing and you, at some point, you have to break out but this whole, all heuristics. I, I think we reverted five variants of that by now. And it never works correctly. So, because it's always a workload which blows up. The main problem is that we have no way to schedule. The scheduler has no control because the BKL is the. I, I, I call Lok and Bottenhoff disable a per CPU BKL because. The protection scope is as defined as we had with the big kernel lock. Nobody knows what it's protect, protects right. actually. But, but it, it switches out every so often, right? Like it, it, I mean, with the threaded mappy stuff and with all the threading that we are adding, I think there's more and more people looking at how to get the scheduler to play appropriately for networking, especially with a bigger system with number, a larger number of CPUs. It, it, it looks like it might be possible in the next couple of years to figure out some way for the scheduler to schedule networking with sufficiently low latency. But this, but for the threading stuff, we still depend on the local uh, BH disable, right? Because we disable it, we get 64 packets, and then we re-enable, uh, we disable bottom halves, do 64 packets, and then we check whether we have to schedule out. So uh, this is very different, right? This, uh, no, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is, I mean, you can do that with preempt disable too. Uh, and say preempt disable, preempt enable, or take a lock and whatever. It it, it doesn't matter. I'm fine. Uh, the thing I'm trying, the argument I'm trying to make, local button half disabled because it's not only for networking. It's used by timers. It's RCU. It's block. It's whatever. So you get this. You, but there's no reason why you would prevent uh, block processing because you're doing network packet processing. There's no reason why you would uh, prevent uh, random HR timers going off just because you're in the network stack. The, 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 the thing is, it's, it's just saying, I'm owning the CPU. So it's, it's not, it, it, it's both ways. So it also affects others. Whoever gains the, I own the CPU, uh, thing first controls the CPU and to the point where it gives it up, um, which might be good for some use cases, but it's not necessarily true. And the thing is, we don't have protection. It doesn't describe a protection scope. This is what bosses me. So what we did for other things where we have preempt disable, preempt enable uh, peers, we introduced this concept of local locks, which are basically compiling to preempt disable enable in uh, in a non rt kernel and we can substitute the lock into it for rt kernels but if you look at the code it is actually entirely clear what the protection scope is but preempt disable and local bottom half disable doesn't tell you anything it's just hey uh, i take something uh, to make others go away but what's what are you protecting that's and, and that's if you really want to go fully threaded and want to be more flexible on scheduling, you need to have the protection scopes and understand that. And I think this is a good way 
if we can utilize, start working on it from the RT perspective to break that up, because we, we are going to find the, the, the spots which actually need serialization, because most of the network stack is serialized anyway, because it takes spin locks. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't work, it wouldn't work on, on, on SMP. So the, 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 the only parts which are really crucial, I think, are the parts where you, where you rely on a local button half disable implicit semantics uh, to protect per CPU variables. And there, when we can find a protection scope for that, whatever the, the, the result is in the very end for, for, for a non rot kernel, doesn't matter, but it also gives you more uh, insight into what are we doing here? Why, why are we disabling button halves? And why do we have to do that for half an hour instead of just doing it here? Because this is the crucial data structure to protect. So that's All right. and for, but for non RT, you're saying we will basically that would just be preempt disabled. Right? Uh, it could be preempt disabled, or you could do uh, at some point you could decide, hey, I, I just uh, have a real spin lock here because it makes sense, right. whatever. Right. Okay. I mean that's that's not not something we need to 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 think about now. It's just, but if you once you have identified these scopes, you can think on the scope level what is the best thing to do, and it could be preempt disabled. Yeah. So, do you need some compressed to push down to achieve that? The question was, do we need a progressive push down? And I've been looking at all the per CPU variables that we have and. Basically, the only thing you can have is per CPU storage because everything else that relies on bottom up disabled, and I found two drivers, are broken SMP as well. And at that point, it's not an RT issue for me because it's broken already. Mm -hmm. So you have per CPU variables, you have the pin timer, and yep. this is it. I don't see any other issues. And the code I have for now for non RT, it's basically. Uh, verifying a lock device that bottom halves are disabled and this is it but on on, on non-rt we have other issues like you pointed out the last time the fact that some uh, soft iq uh, networking code waiting for the completion of some timers and before because of that we cannot have uh, for example timers of iq preempting a uh, Right. Uh, networking soft IQ, for example. Right. But then, but this isn't, uh, this isn't effective. Yeah, yeah, the soft IQ will raise and fire as it would. Yeah. This is fine. Yeah, I think it seems like a reasonable direction. Just a question of how to code it, up, code it up nicely, right? So it looks pretty. And then we can start, you know, scoping things. Okay, so I mean, I would have to, um, Peter isn't aware of this, so Peter will, I need to sell the first few patterns to Peter and then I come back to you guys. What do you need from Peter? Um, the guard thing, the whole part for the locking. Sorry? The, the, um, for lo this oh, is the guards, yeah, the guards, uh, yeah, well, yeah, let's think about the yeah. guards. I mean, uh, you once you're familiar with them, maybe, but like, the thing is, this is look... my first time seeing them and it looks like, uh, yeah. I mean, if you look at it from, um, the XDP point of view, where you have um, you, you invoke the XDP DPF code, and then you have the switch case, and most of them have returned here, there, and there, and there. Then you yeah. have unlock at each and every iteration, and that way you just do the guard at the top, and you are done for the yeah. Thing. For the for the XDP case, um, my one requirement would be we can't be changing the drivers. The drivers can't get more complicated because we're doing this. We need to figure out a way to lock it on the outside or somewhere in the XDP stuff, like internally, because right. You know, I don't want to be changing every driver, it's too much. Oh, work. I did that yeah. already. I think 40. <laughs> no, no, you did the flash checking, right? That was great. But uh, you didn't have to change all the drivers. And here, I thought you were taking a guard around the call to inside the driver, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, each one of them. Where are we? Oh, I mean, you mean, oh, you, you have patches in your tree, right? Because not publicly, but yes. All right, I mean, okay, okay, okay. I mean, this yeah. is a CPSW. Then we have. I mean, I gave just a few examples, but I covered them all. Okay. okay. Yeah, we talked about it a couple of times. So they are all slightly different. We can try to pull out more of it. I mean, yeah. I can send you the whole batch as one patch for the drivers, and then you take a look and yell at me what you want. I looked at a couple of them, and they are slightly different for no reason. So. 
Uh, it's mostly copy and paste and then rearrange it and rename variable names or whatever and have some other data structure adding to it. So I think you could uh, consolidate quite some of that stuff. I mean, the point the, is that the network mapping and unmap and so on, the error case is different, so this differs from each and every one. But this concept we have here that we have the BPF code and redirect as the next thing so we can scope it together and then the cleanup afterwards is would look reasonable to me. Yeah, I mean, the, this is perfectly fine to, to go into a, into a common into a common place. Uh, I will, yeah, so I would just show this is what I have. Yeah. And then you would say, yes, no, this is different. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, the main question here was, I think, whether the network people are seeing any uh, horrific problem with that approach going going at least for, for, for RT for the moment. I don't. We'll, we'll see what Eric thinks. He's not here, but uh, let's start sending the patches in. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cheers. Any other questions, comments? All right. Oh. Uh, just quickly as a heads up for the uh, time weight stuff, uh, I have a patch for that. Reverse the uh, order of setting up the timer, and then I think we can remove the. Uh, oh no, I have disable. So. But come again, I didn't. Get the you. the time weight thing. Yes. Uh, I have a patch that reverses the order in which the timer is set up and makes it unpinned because it was causing interference on isolated CPUs. So ah, I haven't looked at it, it yet. So this was my list, but if you have it, thank you. Just as a heads up. Okay, good. I'm behind you. Okay. Seem to have two different variants of scope, guard, and just guard. Does it explode in an obvious way when you use the wrong one? No, it doesn't matter. It's um, so guard is here, and when the, when you have a return somewhere, you leave the scope uh, block wide because you have an if, and then you have a guard, and you leave that if you haven't returned the middle, then you have the unlock automatically added, and you have to have the scope guard. Then you it's something like you would do an explicit block in C. Yeah, I'm just saying that often you start without the redirect, so you'd have the, just the playing guard, and then you'd later add code to add redirect. And if you don't know about these guards, you're not going to change to scoped guard. So you want it to clearly explode at compile time or, or run time to know you've messed it up. Will it do that? No. <laughs> so how are you going to know you've got it wrong? Well, the... It doesn't matter if you could do scope. I'm talking about incremental development where you start off without the redirect and I later you, you decide to implement redirect and you need to change yeah, your but, guard. But but if so we could just check in in the cold functions with the lock depth or search to whether they are held. So it explodes in your face then. That's the best way to make enough. it explode. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's what lock depth is for. We take the lock inside BPF and then release it in the do redirect so that it's not in the driver. Come again. Take the lock when we in the when the BPF does a redirect and then release it in the do redirect. Daniel. The thing is the BPF run may access the PCP variable and you need the same consistent state within redirect. So we get right. preempted with another one, it's gone. Right. So before you start touching it inside BPF, you take the lock, you start touching it because the driver is required to basically do run, do right, do redirect if it, the program okay. returns redirect. Okay, well. <laughs> it kind of works, but it's really horrible because you, you return from a function with a lock held perhaps, mm. and then you go into a other function which releases the lock perhaps. Uh, that, that makes no that violates my taste buds <laughs> no actually it's hard i mean you can't do it but it, it makes it hard it, it makes makes it hard to get right harder than necessary i think I, we, we rather go and look at the drivers how much we can standardize out this code because the five i looked at 
all the same code, just slightly different for no reason. So, it, and if we have a common helper for that and, and, and fix up the call sites, then you have one place where we have to have to get the locking straight and not 50. And having the helper will also help uh, new uh, network drivers to get it wrong in the first place. I think also at the, at the, at the, at the NetConf, we discussed to refactor those drivers and move the XTP stuff into the core. But that will probably happen after after your work, because we're not well, there I think yet. you should, uh, you know, that's a prerequisite <laughs> as far as I can tell. All right, I think we are out of time. So thank you. Thank you.